Hey everybody, it's Winter here with the Shift Spotlight and today we are here with Doug Thorpe and Doug is a CEO coach and he can be found at dougthorpe.com. That's T-H-O-R-P-E.com. And uh, we're lucky to have you here today because our listeners are all CEOs and business owners. So uh, tell us what, what exactly does a CEO coach do? Well, the way I like to describe it, Winter, and, and first let me say thank you for having me on the show. It's a real privilege. You guys got a, got a great program there and uh, something that uh, I share a lot of interest in. Well, a CEO coach, as I like to put it, I, I want to help business owners move from founder to CEO. Mm -hmm. And the reason I have a passion for that is I spent uh, in my earlier career, I was 20 plus years a banker. I watched a lot of businesses come out of the gate, uh, do uh, some great things and build to a certain level, but then hit some kind of invisible wall and never seemed to get past that. They never really scaled to that third or fourth level. They, they got really frustrated, felt very alone, et cetera, et cetera. And when I really started studying it, I realized the founder needs to make a shift. And that's why I think the shift spot is a really good deal. You guys, we did not even ask him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good description. And um, the uh, that's where I come in. I try to help those founders figure out what is missing, where their blind spots may be, and what are the choices they need to make to really start thinking like a full-blown CEO so that they can take their business to that next level. And it's a great way to say it. You know, when when you start out typically as a founder, CEO, entrepreneur, right? You're, you're kind of, you got your hands in all the pots. And uh, you said, you know, you help them figure out what's missing. What's missing in the mindset of a CEO or business owner that prevents them from being the person who's a visionary and working on the business versus working in the business all the time? Like what, what is missing? Is it control? Is it, uh, is it fear? What is, what is the thing that you've noticed in your experience that is lacking there? Well, the real answer to that, Winter, is that it can be a number of things. There, there's a number of possibilities, and I'll, I'll say these in no particular order. One that is occasionally or honestly frequently there is a little bit of ego. It, it's yeah. like, I know where I want this business to go. Nobody knows it like I do. And what that does, it really stifles the ability to delegate and deploy a bigger talent team to, to go do this very thing you want to do. And one of the most specific visual graphics I can suggest is that if you're the founder, think of the old classic hourglass. You've got that little bitty point in the middle where all the grains of sand run through. Well, if that's the picture of your business and you're the guy clamping that middle, you don't get a lot of throughput, you don't get a lot of efficiency, and it takes way too long for the flow to happen. And the same thing can happen with that founder that's not ready to move to the CEO mindset. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. e ego's one of the big issues, but, but there are elements of fear. It's like, uh, you know, can I trust people to do what I want them to do? And my usual argument to that is, well, maybe you don't have the right people. <laughs> right, if, right. And it is it's always a, a people issue. But like what I'm really hearing here is quite often the person that has the biggest vision for the company is is the bottleneck to that company realizing their vision, right? Totally, totally. So, and, and, and it's like, uh, you know, they don't mean to be, right? It's not like they want to be the bottleneck of their company, but there is that certain amount of, there's a certain personality, right? I, I know the product or, or I started this and it's my baby kind of a deal. But, um, you know, we've really seen it where, where owners have to shift from being the person that can control all of that to to empowering the right people to take that vision to the next level. You know, you talk about people plateauing, they get to a certain level and they plateau. Can we talk about the ones who 
You know, they're already doing so much. They've got their hands in so many pots right now. And they're going, you know what? I don't want to scale anymore. I want to I want to go backwards. I think I'd do better off if I just scaled back and 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 played a little smaller because I don't want to take on any more work. I mean, they're two different problems, but they come from the same mindset. That's a valid choice. And and it is just that. It's the choice. And and one way I like to challenge clients to think about it is all right, let's go back to square one. What was your vision? What is your end game here? Do you want to build a revenue generating asset that you can sell for some 2x, 3x multiple at the 10 year, 20 year mark, whatever? Or do you want to just create a lifestyle for yourself that is comfortable, workable, it's not a huge stretch? but you're comfortable in what the scenario you were describing is the latter, the, the idea that, okay, I got my business up to 2 million, 3 million, maybe it's throwing off a couple of hundred thousand for me personally. And that's, that's a good life. I can, I can live with that. I don't want things complicated. I want to keep it simple. I just want to operate that way. Well, that's a choice and that's great. But I think the real rub is that most founders don't really think about that end game and work toward that end game. They just sort of go with the flow, they go with the tide, and if it gets them there to something, then they make a decision about what that can look like. And that really goes back to figuring out your why. You know, I I did luxury real estate for many, many years, and when in the process, you know, if if the purchase didn't happen, it's often because the buyer lost sight of their why. And so I would have to continually reinforce the why throughout the process in order for them to make the decision. And that is so helpful for CEOs to have that coach or have that group or have that peer group, you know, like what we do here at the shift spot is to continually help them reinforce that why, because it's easy to get lost sight when you're firing this person and this fire is going on now. And, you know, now you've got a staffing issue over here and the, you know, now you're focusing on sales and market, it's easy to get your why lost in the day to day. Absolutely. And and that's why, you know, as the old saying goes, if you uh, don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Well, that's, that's what this is about is making that conscious decision to put a marker out there and, and maybe it's a, it's a BHAG or a really audacious goal that you've got. Great. That's if that's your personality and you want to go for that super, but put it out there and keep it out there and stay focused on it. I've actually had clients, this sounds a little woo woo, but I've actually had clients build a vision board, you know, a, a little framed picture they keep in their office of things that represent where they want to be and, and, and the lifestyle or the outcome they're really trying to work for. And, you know, it, it might include a kid in a cap and gown graduating from college. Okay, great. That's part of the mix. If that's what you're working toward, wonderful. But the point is it keeps that vision out in front of you and keeps you focused with the clarity you need to run the business. Yeah. And I'm all for woo woo. Um, I do vision boards every single year. And uh, when I first wanted to work for myself, it was back in the day, back in 2007. And like, that was like the beginning of the end for the housing crisis for, you know, layoffs. And um, I put up a picture of me in, uh, well, it wasn't me. It was a girl in pajamas and, and she had a laptop on her couch. And I was like, I want to work from home. And this is like way before working from home was a deal, right? want to work from home. I want to work for myself and I want to work in pajamas. And, uh, you know, you don't always get it the first year, but, but like almost everything without fail, I, I ended up getting on that vision board. So you're, you're in good company with woo woo stuff. Um, all right. So in your experience, what are the struggles that you kind of see all CEOs go through, like, let's call it the first year, the third year and fifth year, right? Like, what are kind of those roadblocks at this point in juncture that you've seen most CEOs and business owners struggle with? That's a great question. And what I'd like to do is start with a little bit of a a picture, you know, 
when you go to business school or, or take a course, they talk about business growth, they inevitably draw some chart of this nice upward sloping graph. And, you know, your year one, year two, year three, you're going to 10%, 20%, whatever growth, and you're going to dot, dot, dot up this line. In small business, that's not how it happens. Mm-hmm. Your line is like a staircase, e- even if, if it is <laughs> upward sloping. And what I mean by that, that is you're going to be rocking along and you're going to hit these giant decision points. And let me give you an example. If, if your business idea is to manufacture some kind of widget, you probably have a really big piece of equipment that's at the center of being able to produce that. Well, you make that investment, you raise the money, you, you buy your first piece of equipment, but guess what? That machine has a capacity and it can only produce maybe 100 widgets a day, and, and that's where you're capped. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're selling those and you, you start to get some market exposure and demand starts to come in, well, next thing you know, your orders are greater than 100 a day. They might be 105, they might be 103, but they're greater than 100 a day. So what do you have to do? You have to think about a second machine. Well, that's no small ticket. That's a giant Mm -hmm. capital raise. And so if you plot all that out in the course of your business, it represents that giant step up on the chart. The same thing is true with the personnel, the people you're bringing onto your team to try to grow and perhaps even build a bona fide leadership team. You're not just the one chief anymore, you want to, maybe you're the founder and you want to hire a chief operating officer or a head of sales or a head of finance, you know, and and that represents incremental that, that can be large on the relative scale of, of your financial condition. So that plot is these giant stair steps. So back to your question, the challenge for the owner founder is to have the guts and you know, fortitude to pull the trigger and make those giant stair step leaps when it's appropriate. And yeah. making that decision can be really, really hard for most owners. What makes the decision so hard for them? Is it is it risk? Is it, um, you know, they don't know if it's going to pay off? Like what, is it because they're just bogged down? What, what, what makes it so hard for them? Because like in the beginning, you know, it's like, I'm going to start this company. There was no holds bar. We're going to do this, right? But the decisions become bigger and bigger as you go further and further into it. Well, some of it, it is all based in fear. It, it's the fear I don't have enough money to pay for this person. And, um, you know, that that's because maybe your cash flow is still a little tight. It's positive, but it's a little tight. And even with those extra orders, you're not sure. Um, It could be an uncertainty about your own ability to make a choice and make a selection. In the case of hiring, let's face it, most people are lousy interviewers and lousy hiring professionals. If you've never done that as a critical part of your job, you don't know how to do that. You don't know what questions to ask. The typical interview goes like, I'm the owner and you come in to be interviewed. I start telling you how great and wonderful our company is. I don't ask anything about what you know and what you can do and what you've done before and give me some examples, tell me some stories. I don't ask you to do that. I just start telling you how great our company is. You nod your head and smile and say, great, I'll take a paycheck, Uh, you know, sign me up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's funny. Um, So I have always been an awesome interviewee. And uh, I would say like, it didn't matter where or what I'd get the job because I'm just so great at really it was confidence even back in the beginning. But then, you know, in real estate, I interviewed for a living every every house, a listing appointment I went to was an interview. And so I'm telling Ken what a great interviewee I am that I can just like handle anything. And he starts to interview me. And it was brutal. Ken is an amazing interviewer. I couldn't answer a third of his questions. So, you know, I, I think there is this unfortunate, you know, we, we learn on the job as a CEO and business owner a lot of times. And with people, that's a very expensive lesson because 
if you don't know how to interview them right and you hire the wrong person, you're you're having to replace that person or it's causing a whole other host of issues. So what are a couple tips to give our you know listeners about the proper way to interview? And let's say, let's say for our leadership team, what, what would be some tips to interview for a leadership position? Well, I am a big fan of what is popularly called by our HR friends, the behavior-based interviewing. Mm -hmm. And and the, the theory behind that is if you can understand prior behavior, it is a reasonable and perhaps even good predictor of future success. So what do I mean by that? The question would be something like, hey, Winter, tell me about a time when you had two supervisors that couldn't agree on a situation. What did you do? How did you mm -hmm. lead them through that? Mm -hmm. and, and you begin to tell me a story about you know, that circumstance. So what that does, it covers a couple of things. Number one, do you even have the experience dealing with that? And, and usually the scenarios I might bring up are exact problems that I know in the back of my mind I've got going on right now out there in the shop. I've got two supervisors that can't stand each other. And I don't want to deal with it. I want my new <laughs> operations head to deal with it. So... I need to ask you, have you ever done that before? And tell me about it. What did you do? Well, what did you, how did you approach it, et cetera? So if you set up those behavior-based kinds of questions, you get your candidate to walk you through that, and then you can make a decision. If they sound like they've never come anywhere close to doing those things, guess what? They're probably not your person. Right. It's not, you don't want to bring them in to train them how to do it. The second thing on that note, by the way, I have a good HR friend who has an independent hiring and placement practice. And what he does, he tells entrepreneurs, let's use a number. If your company is topside at 3 million and you want to go to 5 million and you want to hire a sales head to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't want to hire somebody that's at two or three million, just like you are. You want to hire the person that's already run a $5 million sales team. Yeah. Find them so they know how to teach you how to go to 5 million on the sales side. Yeah. They always say if uh, you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I think one of the things that CEOs don't do enough of is bring in people who can advise them better than what they know. Exactly. And, um, and it, and it does come down to, I think the hiring process and not asking the right questions because, you know, it, it, if the leader can bring up people to elevate them, then they actually get to be that visionary and they get to open other channels for revenue to come in because they're not doing the day-to-day -day stuff as much. So, um, so in working with all the CEOs that you've worked with, what would you, what would your, like, if you were going to give advice to a younger CEO, somebody starting out through the mistakes of all the CEOs you've coached over your career, what, what advice would that be? What would you tell them? One of the big things I go to, and I, I use this on virtually all of my coaching clients, I challenge people to figure out what it means to be able to be intentional with your effort every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll go back to what we said earlier about having a vision. Well, if you've got a vision and you kind of solve backwards for the pathway to get there to that vision, then you've got a sense of day by day, week by week, month by month, what do I need to accomplish to get there? Mm -hmm. And it, once you start defining what those challenges are and those opportunities need to be, you need to become very intentional day by day for getting those things done. Don't yeah. let the noise and the chatter and the, and the busyness of owning a business distract you from getting those things done. Uh, some people, you know, the, the EOS teaching talks about big rocks and, and having those key strategic initiatives that you've got to work on. When people talk about OKRs, those are strategic company level focus points. And I think young entrepreneurs tend to just kind of get 
caught up in the wave and and they get busy next logical thing comes up it pops up oh you know i'm running short on my bank account i need to run to the bank and make a deposit and you know it it and and while all that needs to be done the question is when the day is over what have you done that has strategic significance for moving the needle and getting you closer to your goal yeah i i love that um you know there's a a great book by wayne dyer about um being intentional the whole book is about being intentional and it really does make a difference if you're just doing tasks and checking to do's you know or or having the meetings you're it's going to take you you might get there but it's going to take a whole lot longer and it's going to cost you a whole lot more than than being very intentional about where you put your efforts and say you know what i make too much to be doing this specific thing i need to delegate this to somebody else um i you know i i used to sit down and, and create like a what i'm worth an hour analogy and i would take my annual salary and i would divide it by how many hours i worked and i would say okay it's 650 an hour and then when i would like set up my what i had to do the next day i'd be like is this something that a person 650 an hour would make i, I would make make up numbers of what I thought I was worth an hour, you know, just so that I focused on the things that would move the needle as opposed to being a taskmaster and feel. And like, sometimes there is some comfort in like crossing that to do off and feeling accomplished, but accomplished, feeling accomplished isn't, isn't necessarily like the, the visionary side of things, right? It's, it's more task mastery. Right. Well, and, and the challenge is, what is the value of those things you got done? Like you you say, well, if, if somebody tells me I'm going to spend an hour first thing in the morning clearing out my inbox of my email, I'm going, really? That's that's what you think is important? Mm-hmm. And and you've, you've wasted a lot of energy. Most people, not everybody, but most people are most productive earlier in the day, and you want to spend your high energy, a high focus time plowing through e- emails in an inbox. No, I say turn off the email <laughs> and right. and be intentional and focus on that big rock that you need to get done and see if you can move the needle on that. And then you you will find time to go plow through those emails and get them taken care of. Yeah. But yeah. people have that false sense of accomplishment that, oh, look at me. I got my inbox cleared out this morning by nine o'clock. It's like, who gives a rip, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So where do you see yourself investing resources for growth over the next year? What what does 2024 look like for for Doug Thorpe? Well, for me, I am a perpetual learner. I I am constantly studying and learning and and exploring. And for me right now, I'm trying to get a really good lead on the the whole advent of AI. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm, I have always my whole life been an early adopter of technology. I've never, ever, ever been afraid of anything. I've tried them. And of course, yeah, all right, that meant I once upon a time I had a a palm and a and a and a blackberry and some of those. Oh, brands. I loved my crackberry. I loved my crackberry. I it was brutal to give it up. Brutal to give it up. I had a trio. Do you remember the trios? Oh yeah. I had oh, a yeah. trio too. Yeah. <laughs> Love well, that. <laughs> my, my story on the blackberry. I I had just received mine. It had gotten shipped to my office in at the bank where I worked. But midday, I had to head to the airport and get on a flight, and uh, t- to go from Houston to Dallas. And I was playing with my blackberry in my seat on the airplane, and there was a jolt and a jar, and I dropped it, and it slid th- the full length of the cabin. Oh wow, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> And uh, it took me a while to locate it. The stewardess or, or, the, or the attendant, I guess now they call them, was very helpful and very friendly. And That's it was funny. a Southwest flight. So they made, you know, I became a laughing stock for a moment while we went through that. But yeah, so, but uh, back to the question, I, I've i always been kind of an early adopter and I am absolutely intrigued by AI uh, just actually had a guest on my own podcast who was a world-class expert in the field. 
he gave an amazing explanation of how we as business owners should be thinking about AI. Mm -hmm. That was my, that was my lead off question on my show. What the hell is AI and what should I be doing with it? Right, right. And, and he nailed it. I mean, it, it was, it was powerful. It was really good information. So, so that's my big horizon item. Yeah. Okay. What do you think CEOs should be investing in, in 2024? Well, I think there is a is a clear shift in the mindset of most, you use the word again and you didn't did even mean to do it. <laughs> I did use the word. It it it, it it's very valuable. Um, there is a shift in the mindset of the workforce. The whole <laughs> COVID event has clearly made people rethink. Truthfully, you really get to the heart of the matter, everybody was confronted with their own mortality for a time there. Yeah. Because there was too much uncertainty, too much we didn't know. This really could be the end of the world. You know, all of that thinking was going on. But the way it's manifested is the people you're going to hire and bring into your business are going to have a different attitude about work. You know, mm -hmm. what is work? What's my commitment to the boss? What's my commitment to this company? And leaders, owners need to pay attention to that. The what it did before 2020, thinking about managing and leading your business, it's probably not going to work the way it mm -hmm. once did. Mm -hmm. Everything from perks and incentives that you're giving to basic business model you know, like everybody needs to come sit in the office all day long, every day. And, you know, those kind of issues, it's just different. And there are yeah. a lot of studies that have been done. There are a lot of people that are paying very close attention. And most of the pundits have gone on record as saying, this is a shift of the magnitude of the technology revolution, the industrial revolution, and the whole Renaissance period going way back in time. Yeah. So it's, it's cultural, it's societal, and owners need to pay attention. They need to yeah. spend a little bit of time getting some coaching, some help, and some consulting to take a hard look at what they could do differently to keep people engaged and, and most importantly, retain the talent that you value. Right. You know, it was back in the day, I'm paying your bills. I'm pay Here's the paycheck. You do it a say. And it is it is not that time anymore. And if owners are stuck in that mindset, um, they, they aren't going to go very far because uh, it, it requires a whole new skill set and one that you don't really want to learn. But you have to, you know, you, you don't want to have to relearn this whole thing again. But the, the one thing in, in life that is constant is change. And we are we are in a very different work world than ever before. For sure. And and people feel empowered to be willing to vote with their feet. If 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 I get hired and get into a work situation and I don't like what I'm seeing or feeling, I don't spend a lot of time suffering through it and figuring it out. I, I pull the trigger and I go. I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I know. It's like, how, how do, how do bills get paid anymore? You know, you used to stay at a miserable job to get your bills paid. And now people are like, I'll figure it out. Don't worry about me. I'll get a side right. hustle. I'll figure right. it out. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, this was, um, I, I love this conversation. I thought it was super valuable. I know that our listeners are really going to love it. Um, there is something that you are offering to your listeners. So do you want to talk about that? Yeah, Winter, what, what I do is I am happy to talk with people who are curious. I, all over my website, uh, there are buttons and links to click to sign up for a free discovery call where you and I can just spend a minute talking about your concerns and ideas. And we'll, we'll just explore the issue, whether or not I might be able, able to help you with where you are right now and where, where you would like to go. So hop over to my website, that's dougthorpe.com. Click any of the call to action buttons that talk about the, the free consultation or the discovery call. It's really the same thing, but uh, get on the book and let's, let's have a chat. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. It was, it was incredibly valuable. Happy to be here. Thanks.